Hey guys, long time no talk to. I hope you're all doing well and that you're healthy and safe and that you're feeling loved and that you're being productive too because busy is good. So if you're not busy, then get busy. Go for a walk or something. Play the piano. Meet up with old friends maybe or make new friends. And pretty much if you're on social media, then definitely limit yourself to just one hour per day because in my opinion, it is not healthy at all to park it on YouTube for too much of your day, for sure. So with that being said, let's get into it. This is what I want to say. First, if you live in the United States, please vote. I don't care who you vote for. That's up to you. But I do care whether or not you vote. Because voting is so important. It's our opportunity to speak. So again, if you live in the United States, then please vote. Let your voice be heard. Next, I want to say this. If you're a survivor of family abuse, are you protecting your children and yourself? Are you still living with an abuser? Do you even know? Whether you're male or female, does your husband or wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever you call your significant other, do they control you? Are you afraid of them? Are you afraid of their temper? Are you afraid to speak up? Do you find yourself just going along to get along? Does your spouse control your finances? Is your spouse a liar? Do you feel nervous about calling your family members or your friends? Or is it maybe just easier for you to avoid certain people that your spouse doesn't approve of instead of trying to stand up for your right to speak with your family members and your friends? I just want to say this. If you're in a relationship that has a severe power imbalance, I want you to know that you deserve to be safe. You deserve to have a voice. You deserve to have your own opinions. You deserve to be happy. And most important of all, if you have children that are still at home, if you have young children, your children deserve to be safe. So if you're living in a relationship that you're worrying about the safety and well-being of your children, then it's time for you to brave up and to begin to explore the possibility of you being able to safely get out of a bad relationship if it is the best for your children for you to do so. If you do decide to leave, then don't go announcing it to your spouse or using the threat of leaving to try to get your spouse's attention or thinking that if you threaten to leave that your spouse will somehow magically change into the person you keep trying to pretend to yourself that your spouse has the capacity to become. Figure out your own income. Figure out your own shelter. Figure out how you can support yourself and your children without being dependent on someone who has abused you. Make a plan. Make a safe 
escape plan because that's what matters is that you're safe and that your children are safe. Protect your children and protect yourself. Now, this is what I want to cover in this video. Oh, wait, one more thing before I get started. I want to let you know about our Patreon group and the videos we've been uploading lately. Our latest series is on the police interviews. We have six videos up so far on the first interview that we're covering. The one I think is just an hour and a half long of Christopher Watts' wife's friend. Pretty much I just go through the interviews slowly and give my opinion here and there. For example, something I hadn't noticed before working on this series is that when the friend of Christopher Watts' wife was giving her police interview, it was a lot like the phone call. She talked and she talked and she talked. Well, the person she was talking to, well, they listened and listened and listened. That was interesting to notice, the free-flowing statement from one topic to the next, like hopping and skipping and jumping. Plus, the rate of her speech was noticeable, too. At some points, her rate of speech was well over 500 words per minute, which I found that to be kind of interesting. Another thing I noticed and that I find very interesting is two times so far, because we're just like an hour into it, two times so far, Christopher Watts' wife's friend fully admits that she did not tell the truth. And I know it seems kind of minor, but I think it's interesting just the same. Like when she said that Christopher Watts called her because she and her son were setting off the alarms at the house and he would call her and he said, you're setting off the alarms. Well, after he had already called her, I think a couple of times at least, saying, you're setting off the alarms, they set off the alarms again. And Christopher Watts called again, and he said, are you still at the house? Because the alarms are going off again. And the friend, who was still at the house and still setting off the alarms, told Christopher Watts that she and her son were no longer at the house, even though they were. So I thought that was interesting that she lied to Christopher Watts about whether or not she was still at the house. I mean, that just seemed kind of odd to me. If they set off the alarms and he called again to say, are you still at the house because the alarms are still going off or the alarms are going off again? Why lie about it? Why not tell the truth? Another interesting part was when the friend said that she told Christopher Watts that she had already called the police before she said that she had actually already called the police. So why would she have said that if it wasn't true? Or could it be that maybe before that one call to the police that has been posted online for the public to hear that maybe she actually had already called the police. Yeah, the case of Christopher Watts, full of so many unanswered questions, really. So many discrepancies. Doesn't this case just reek? of one discrepancy after another. And also one more thing that was very interesting about this first interview that we're discussing right now was that Christopher Watts' wife's friend was told by Christopher Watts' wife's mother to check the knives. Check the knives? Why? 
Was Christopher Watts' wife known for self-harming? Did Christopher Watts' wife have some kind of history of self-harm? I find it pretty interesting that Christopher Watts' wife's friend was not asked follow-up questions right at that point in the interview. Or the statement, I think I'll call it. She talked about the statement, check the knives, when she was told to check the knives, then she scraped right along, right away, like she glossed right over it, to say then she checked out the basement, and then she was looking for the purse. Like I said before, hopping, skipping, and jumping. I think at that point that you learned that the mother is saying to check the knives, I would have been ready with a few follow-up questions. Like, why do you think she wanted you to check the knives? Did your friend have any history of suicide attempts? Did your friend have any history that you know of specific to any depression or suicidal ideation? Did your friend have any mental illness going on that you were aware of? Have you ever noticed any scarring on her wrists or her arms? Do you know if your friend uses any drugs? Do you know if your friend has ever been hospitalized for mental illness? Do you think it's possible your friend may have harmed herself? Do you think it's possible that your friend may have harmed the children? I would have also been curious why Christopher Watts' wife's friend was so concerned when she contacted the police. I would have asked if she went to the house every morning. I would have asked if she was there to maybe help Christopher Watts' wife with the children. Or if she routinely drove them to daycare at opening time. Okay, so now let's hop topics here to a different case. The case of Josh Powell and his missing wife, Susan Cox Powell. Susan Cox Powell went missing, I think it was in 2009, in December of 2009 two or three weeks before Christmas, right in the middle of the cold winter weather. And the strangest thing, when she went missing, when the children did not show up at daycare, the police were called. According to Josh Powell at the time, he had taken his two young children, Charlie and Braden, on a camping trip the night before. And when he returned home the next day, the police were already searching for his wife. Isn't that kind of odd? In both cases, the case of Christopher Watts and in the case of Josh Powell, the police were called right away when the children were not in daycare. Interesting. In the case of Josh Powell, he was never placed under arrest. They never found Susan's body. And in the case of Josh Powell, because he was never under arrest and placed in custody stemming from his wife's disappearance, CPS was working toward reunification with his children, which included allowing Josh Powell supervised visits with the kids. Well, tragically, during one of those supervised visits, Josh got the kids inside the house fast while the supervisor was still making her way up the walk toward the front door. He got the kids inside fast and then he killed them. And then he killed himself all while the visitation supervisor was frantically calling 911 asking for help. She didn't know what to do. 
and the dispatcher didn't seem to grasp the severity of the situation at first. So the poor woman was even more frantic as she stood outside of Josh Powell's house, banging on the door, yelling at him to let her in while he murdered little Charlie and Braden and then committed suicide. Josh Powell's brother committed suicide too. I don't know how many years later, I think about three or four years later. What a terrible tragedy for everybody involved. Okay, well now, fast forward. Over a decade later, after Josh Powell went camping, supposedly, with his sons in December, I think it was, of 2009, Charlie and Braden's grandparents sued the state and they won. And the estates of Charlie and Braden were awarded $98 million. Just my opinion, I think that amount is somewhat excessive, but I am happy for the grandparents just the same. And I hope that the department uses the tragedy as a teaching moment for sure, so that changes can be made in order to better protect other children in the future. Now back to the case of Christopher Watts. You know how we've been told over and over again that there were two court cases coming up scheduled for soon after the tragedy, one for a financial matter, the unpaid HOA dues, which I think were just $1,500 yet remained unpaid. And we were told there was a court hearing pending for, quote, an ongoing family matter. Well, combine that with all the claims that there was an open CPS case and think about it. And remember also that the Watts family lived in a county which was known for having the model CPS program that focused on keeping the children in the home if the caseworkers felt it could safely supervise the situation that the children would be safe to be left in the home instead of removing the children, then working toward having the parents jump through a bunch of hoops in order to work toward reunification with the kids. So I guess depending on the nature of the abuses that were substantiated, the caseworkers would decide whether or not each new case qualified for that model program. So here's my question. You know how right from the start it looks like the attacks against so many people were organized and certain people were targeted right from the start, including me, long before anybody had a clue what our opinions on the case even were. But I want you to think about this. I've written articles supporting our Second Amendment rights following the Sandy Hook tragedy when the politicians were saying we needed more gun control laws. And I've written also back in 2016 on how, in my opinion, our president was going to win. And I was also named the number one Trump talker of my state during the 2016 campaign. So the fact that I've been getting attacked for two years straight by self-proclaimed liberals who push for gun control and who say bad things about our president and who lie about our president and who lie about me 
and who post slanderous and libelous and defamatory content online against me, and who harass my family members and me, and who harass my employers, and who make threatening phone calls, and who send threatening text messages, etc., etc., etc. Well, when you think about it, and you see how conservatives are being treated both online and on the streets in our major cities too, right? Then it sure seems pretty clear to me that the yahoos who are attacking me are being egged on by the yahoos who think it's cool to try to silence the conservative pro-Second Amendment voices, right? Now add to all of this that I have been writing on true crime cases for over 12 years now, often writing about mothers who murder their own children, by the way. And there you have it, the perfect storm, right? How to silence, or try to silence, the number one Trump talker in my state. Hmm. Well, along comes the case of Christopher Watts, and right away, within days of this case hitting the headlines, the attackers were in full swing, creating fake profiles using my name and my photo, posting and sending terrible comments, as if those comments were posted and sent by me. Discredit, abuse, harass, ridicule, threaten. The attackers pulled out all the stops trying to quote, destroy. That's their word. That's their stated goal to try to quote, destroy my life. They gang up, they lie, they con people into believing that I'm some kind of terrible. Well, in fact, it is the attackers themselves who are the terrible ones. They want me to be afraid of them. They want me to feel bad, to feel sad, to feel embarrassed somehow based on all the lies that they're spreading about me and their attempt to, quote, destroy my life. Well, I'm not afraid of them because I'm not afraid of liars. I'm not afraid of abusers. I'm not afraid of their scumbag threats and their seemingly evil tactics and tricks to try to scare me into silence. I do support our president. I do support our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, too. And... I support our right to discuss true crime cases that are in the headline news, to discuss our own opinions on the case, and to do so safely without risk of being attacked by a gang of thugs. And you know, I'm not the only person who has been attacked since the case of Christopher Watts has hit the headlines either. There are plenty of us under attack, and lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, the others I have spoken with who are also under attack by the gang-stalking abusers are also strong supporters of our president, too. Interesting. So, what I've learned, or part of what I've learned so far from this experience, is that there are groups or gangs of gang stalking thugs that you can hire or recruit or engage with to attack people in order to try to ruin their reputations in order to somehow protect your own brand or your own business or your own agency or your own reputation and then when you have your targets being attacked, then there are companies lining up called online reputation management companies. 
that charge many thousands of dollars to help your targets, quote, repair the damage that you've done. It kind of makes you wonder if the online reputation management companies, maybe along with the gang stalking thugs, might all be one and the same. Just like an abuser, right? The abuser creates the injury, then swoops in to rescue. And if you don't know what I'm referring to, then research what's called the cycle of violence, the walking on eggshells, then the assault, and then the honeymoon phase. While the same is happening with the attackers, they traumatize, they threaten, they try to have their targets walking on eggshells. Then they attack, and then they get real busy making stupid videos calling themselves, quote, victim advocates, and they claim they're against bullying, when in fact, they and their bad acts actually define the term. It's no different with family violence. The abuser has everybody believing they're so tough and so smart and in control. And then the abuser abuses. And then the abuser feigns concern for the injuries that the abuser has caused. My first clue that the gang stalking thugs were first attacking me because of my vocal support for our president and for our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms was when the abusive thugs created what they call the, quote, dossier. Oh my goodness, their stupid 700-page dossier that they flooded the internet with, along with fake arrest warrants and their other lies about my family and me. Well, that dossier was packed full of their lies about my family and me, just like the dossier the scumbags created about our president. How disgusting, let me tell you. And how obvious too, for the thugs to even use the word dossier in the first place, especially when the thugs don't even know how to pronounce that word to begin with. Just like when the thugs tried to pronounce the word defamation, remember that? They all called it defamation. And those of us who they have been actively attempting to defame got a big kick out of that mispronunciation, let me tell you. Well, through it all, there was another person also under attack since day one of the case of Christopher Watts hitting the headlines. His mother, Cindy Watts. Now try to see how all of this possibly blends together. The abuser's tactics and tricks are the same. Against Cindy Watts, discredit, defame, frighten, etc. Why? Cindy Watts hasn't written any articles supporting our Second Amendment rights. Cindy Watts wasn't named the number one Trump talker in her state during the 2016 presidential campaign. Cindy Watts hasn't been writing about true crime cases for over 12 years about mothers who murder their own children. So why on earth was Cindy Watts also targeted right from the start? Well, just my opinion, but I think Cindy Watts knows a lot about this case that certain people would prefer she didn't know. And I think that certain people believe that by attacking her, they can somehow make her too afraid to speak about what she knows. Which now brings us back to the case of Josh Powell. $98 million. $98 million awarded to the estates of two children who were murdered by one of their parents. 
$98 million awarded to the children's estates because basically the state failed to protect them. Now let all of that sink in. What's your opinion? Do you think that $98 million is a bit excessive in the award? Do you think that the attacks against Cindy Watts may have been connected somehow to what we were told was a pending court hearing for, quote, an ongoing family matter? Do you believe the claims that there was an open case? Do you believe that Christopher Watts may well have been telling the truth when he stated that he did not murder his daughters, Bella and Cece Watts? Do you believe that the attackers are singling out their targets based on our conservative views? Do you believe that social media has basically turned into a cesspool where the conservative voice is being stifled? Do you believe that the riots are peaceful demonstrations? Do you believe in our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms? Do you believe in our right to discuss and to write about true crime cases without having to be subjected to the risk of being attacked by a gang of abusive thugs? What do you think? Please feel free to join us on Patreon and on BitChute and on Facebook and on WordPress too, where we continue to discuss true crime cases and where we do our best to create a safe space for our members to discuss true crime cases free of abuse from the gang stalking thugs who, as we've been told by a few of them, have been hired while others have been recruited to harass us, to try to frighten us, and overall to try to harm our reputations and discredit us. While it appears the gang-stalking thugs are somewhat clueless actually, as to how the whole reputation thing really works. And I just want to say this, on this channel, we don't pretend abuse away. On this channel, we don't make excuses for abusers. And on this channel, we do not cower or cater to abusers at all.